All right. Today, we're going to do something. We're going to carry on with the theme of what we really are doing. Discussed John's epistles. Um, we framed him. We looked at some stuff. Life of Peter. Uh, not yet. But yeah, you can get it ready. And um, we were, before we really understood the epistles of the men, we had to look at his life. So, with the help of my lovely wife, I started to frame the life of Peter. Now, if you know anything about the Gospels, it seems to be a lot of Peter, yes? So, I'm going to through it before we go into the epistle of one Peter. Okay? So, as we go through this, I thought it would be interesting, and there's some hot topics here, so this might take some time. But for us to be able to gauge the man, some of his themes that his experiences come out through the epistle. So to understand the letter, we have to understand the man. To understand the problems that he's addressing with his experience and how God has prepared him to deal with these specific things. Just like he prepared John to be able to receive the revelation or the book of revelations, he is preparing Peter to do a specific work. And uh, I looked quite thoroughly through. I might have missed one or two things, but there's one or two things where I've included where there's a group scenario, but for the most part, only where it really mentions him. Okay, so otherwise we would be studying all four Gospels all at the same time, trying to figure out who this man is. Okay? So basically, in the beginning, who is Peter? Is that his name? No, his name's Shimon. Shimon, otherwise known as, depending on which language you talk on. Okay, before we get into how we get to Peter, he was the brother of Andrew, and what was his occupation? Fisherman, all right? He was born in a little fishing town called Bethsaida. Okay, later moves to Capernaum, first picture. Little Sea of Galilee and a Capernaum overview. All right. So he moves over there. We know that throughout Scripture, well, we know in Scripture it talks about his mother in law. So he was married and he was one of the three closest disciples, if we could just put it that way. All right. We know mm -hmm. what do we know about Peter's personality? He kind of spoke first. Thought later. Okay, so he was very. He was there. Some pastors like to say he had foot and mouth disease. Every time he opened up his mouth, it was to change feet because he just kept on stepping into it. Right? He said, All right, I say this. And then five seconds later, he's in trouble with something he said. All right, so this is a guy who's not, um, we could probably say, larger than life very much in your face, very much first to get out there, very excitable character. We don't know really stature size if the fact that he was called the rock meant that he was a large boy or it was become because of the foundational statement that comes later. Okay, so he gets the nickname Peter. How do we get to Peter from Shimon? Okay, so his name is Shimon. I'm going to write it out for you. And God says, or he calls him in the beginning, we're going to get into the scripture now, he called him in the Hebrew, Kepha. In the Aramaic, Cephas. And in the Greek, Petros. Which one do you think we have to get to his name? Petros, rock or stone. Okay, now we've got two different viewpoints on this. Scholars have argued about it, so you know me. Like any good rabbi, I'll give you both. On the one hand, it means that he needs to become solid, an unmovable object. And later, we see in the beginning, he's not very unmovable. He's pretty unstable, in fact. But later, he will become a solid figure, especially through Acts, with a little speed wobble from time to time. Other people believe he's not just talking about a rock, but he's talking about a precious stone. So something that is a peculiar treasure. 
And we see that when he talks of, when he reminds them in Peter about being a kingdom of priests. And we take that right back to Exodus 20, and he says, we're a peculiar treasure. So is it possible? Depending on which viewpoint on you want to, how you want to look at it, the answer could be yes. Okay? So, I'm going to jump around a little bit. We're going to be being in the Gospels for obvious reasons. Um, so, to start off our little discussion, <coughs> go to John for me. One, oh, not one, John, John 1. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John. And without getting into the first part, which always seems to take me about three days to discuss, I want you to go to 1 John 41. Yeah, I wrote it down right. Yeah, John, John 1 41. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Don't worry, I won't get confused. The Gospel of John chapter 1. Shall we do that rather? That way I won't confuse myself. Verse 41, he says, the first thing he did was to find his brother Shimon and tell him. Now, this is Andrew we're talking about. We found the Mashiach. The word means, what does Mashiach mean? Anointed one. Okay? Messiah, that's where we get the name. He took him to Yeshua, looking at him. Yeshua said, you are Shimon bar Yochanan, or bar and ben. Bar is Aramaic for son, ben in Hebrew, um, for son. So Simon's dad is called Yochanan, John. You will be known as Kepha, which means rock. Rock. Okay? So, in the beginning, he meets not just fishermen. Who was the one telling them about, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? John the Baptist. So it is believed that Andrew was at least following John and then went to go call his brother and said, we found the Mashiach. Come, let's go. And then from the beginning, Shimon, you are called Rock. Hmm, okay, this is weird. I've just met this guy and he called me a Rock. I don't understand what that means. It's only going to be opened up later. Okay, go to Matthew 14 for me. Matthew 14, from about verse 22. We see he gets introduced to this Messiah, and then becomes something else a little later. Um, he says, immediately he had to tell me to get into the boat and go out ahead of him to the other side. And he sent the crowds away. After he sent the crowds away, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night came on and he was there. But by this time, the boat was several miles away from shore, battling rough sea and headwind. Around four o'clock in the morning, yours might say the third watch, he came toward him walking on the lake. Okay. So kind of fill in the gap for me. Yeshua introduces himself. He picks 12 of the closest tell me them. And he's slowly but surely starting to teach the Talmudim about the kingdom of heaven, about why he's here. And they get to a place just before this, and the crowds kept on following him. Now, what does it mean to be a disciple? Right. So I'm in a process of being trained up to be like my rabbi. I want to become like him. And that traditionally would take a seven-year period. But how can I sit with my Messiah or sit with my rabbi at this point? I don't think they fully understood who he was at times. And they looked at him and then there were all these crowds all the time. How am I supposed to give my one-on-one -on -one lesson if you people keep on interrupting? So just before this, he sees a massive crowd. He feeds them. It's the, it's the miracle of, I think it was 5,000 just before this. And then he looks at him, and then they looked at them, and they complained the whole time. Send them away, let them go, go and do this. But Yeshua kept on looking at the crowds, and it's described as what? He had compassion on them because they were a flock without a shepherd. He says, look at these sheep. They're walking around, and he has compassion. He 
his disciples are not noticing how his rabbi feels about the flock because they should be emulating him. And instead they get frustrated. So he has to teach them to be like him. So let me help you understand the context to the story. Go on ahead, I'll meet you later. And he goes and he gets quiet and he watches them row and row and row. And there's a storm, no surprise to him. And he watches them row and they row. And 10 o'clock at night comes and it passes and they're not getting to where they need to be. 12 o'clock comes, 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. How tired do you think these guys were? And there we go. We have the Messiah sitting there watching them. Lovely guy, right? Savior of the world. And he's not saving his own tell me then. Well, sometimes you have to ask, what's the lesson? So he goes out and he says, he came to the wall. <coughs> Excuse me. He came toward them walking on the lake. Well, that's nice. And he's like, okay, I'll still meet you there. Well, when you guys get there eventually, we can, we can have this conversation. It says, when the Talmudim saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. In the other Gospels, it says he was walking and he was about to walk past. So he wasn't going to stop and say, let's have a conversation about how you feel. Can I help you with anything? And he was going to carry on walking. And how we see this moment, and he says, oh, no, they see this figure walking on the ghost, and they freak out. Why would a fisherman scream ghost? Hey? A human being walking on the water? I don't know. They didn't think he was human. Why would they think that? No, well, they didn't think it was. It was like the Messiah. It's my rabbi. We eat next to him. We sleep next to him. We watch him. We get tired. He gets sick. We, we know all these things. It wasn't glowing. It wasn't. <laughs> Normally, light means angel. Okay? In most cases, when they appear. Right? But you're looking there and he says, look, a ghost. What we need to understand that is and on that water, water represents what to a Jewish person? Normally, chaos. Right? Chaos overtook the world when Noah's flood happened. In the beginning, there was Everything that was darkness and void, and God separated the chaos and He separated the and He gave boundaries for the land and He brought order out of chaos. But not only that, we've got other people on the other side of the lake that worship a, a, a funny deity, starts with a B. No, and He is the God of thunder and rain, and He controls areas like this. Now we're really freaking out. We're in a storm. The rabbi is not with us. We're all alone. We're struggling. And now we see a spook. They said and screamed with fear, but at once she showed it to them. Courage, he said. It is I. Oh, that's going to make everything better. You're walking on water, man. <laughs> You know, I, I just see this thing being played out and I, I enjoy the human emotion that's sort of not there. He says, stop being afraid. Then Peter called to him. He said, Lord, if that is really you, tell me to come to you on the water. All right, now let's, let's get this context. He's a fisherman. Fishermen believe you stay in the boat and you pull the fish out and then they stay on your boat and then you go back, right? You don't really go walking on the water with your fishing pole. Okay, so what has changed in Peter's mind? That every experience he's ever had about climbing into water is now going to be contradictory to what he's trying to do. Something deeply seated about discipleship. If your rabbi calls you, he says, come and be like me. The Hebrew term is lech achorai. Come and walk after me. If he has chosen you, which again, this flips the paradigm, yes? You guys want me to go through that very quickly? Disciples are chosen how? All right, I'm going to write it to you on the side. We have three different levels. In a synagogue, which is basically a community hall, there's normally a side room on the side, okay? When you go into Capernaum Synagogue, you've got the main area, and then just on the right, when you walk through the doors, there's a whole other room. 
Okay, when you go into Gamla, they've got seemingly little side rooms as you walk through before you get into the main hall. Now, some archaeologists believe that's where the school children were trained. Okay, but in your community, you only buy one book. What's your book called? Torah. It's a collection of five books, but it comes up in one scroll. It's expensive. Someone has to write it out. They have to get animals' skins. Okay. Sew it together, impale it, roll it all up after it's been checked how many times to make sure you have the infallible word of God. Now I teach your little kiddies how to read and write using the only book we have. Okay, so I take them through what the first level is called Bet Sefer. Once you get to about 12 years old, you go to the next level. The next level is called Bet Midrash. What's a midrash? A study. So it's the house of study and the house of the book. With a capital B because we're using the Bible. And here at Bed Midrash, we study things like the prophets. We study Psalms. We study Proverbs. We look at the different books and the collections of books. And we see how Torah carries on and when people obeyed Torah what happened and when people disobeyed what happened and what was coming maybe we study the book of Ezekiel maybe we look at Isaiah maybe we ask Daniel what he had to say okay but there was a break here if you were not good enough to go to the next level you would go off and you would become a godly person fishing farming Building. The term for that Messiah says it was a carpenter. That's not the real term. He might have done some carpentry, but the Greek term is tecton. Now, what you see when you go to Israel is you see very little trees and lots of rocks. And when you look at the architecture or the archaeological studies and things like that, what you find are lots of rocks. Stone tables, stone mangers, stone basins. Stone walls, and the only thing that really had wood was your roof. Okay, so he was a builder. As most people exited there, and only a select few went on to study, the next stage would be find a rabbi. What does rabbi mean? Not teacher. Exalted one. It's a pretty big statement. The word for teacher in Hebrew, if you are a lady, mora. If you are a man, more. That's a teacher. Rabbi, exalted one. Why is he exalted? Remember, he's not rich. His basically life revolves around God's word. That's Everything about him is about that scroll. He understands it. He studied it. He's read it. He lives it out and he teaches others to do so. These guys were lifted up in their community, extremely esteemed to the point where some people even go, there's a Jewish proverb that says, if your father and your rabbi were both locked up and you had one chance to free one of them, choose your rabbi. Your father brought you in physically, but he will take you spiritually. Which one has greater repercussions? So he says, you exalt him. Your father will understand. It's fine. I'm like, that's a pretty big statement, right? Yeah. At what age does um, uh, Jesus then start looking for a rabbi? Or go rabbi? don't know exactly, but I'm guesstimating it probably around 17, 18. Okay. Some people will say, okay, we're going to bring it to the age of about 23. So when they fully trained up into the age of 30, then at 30 years old, they would be in full spiritual maturity. So it's possible it could be that. I probably see it a little bit earlier. Okay. Because at 12 and 13 years old, you go through, you're a man now, you have to get up and go and work. Okay. So they would choose a rabbi. Okay. It is the student's choice. The student or a disciple is called a Talmud. It is the student's choice when he looks at the rabbi. He looks and he will, might find a traveling rabbi who comes through, Messiah. They might meet a John the Baptist who also had his own Talmudim disciples. 
and you go through this process. Maybe you really like your rabbi because you like the way he taught you and you want to be that to everybody else. Doesn't matter. You go and you talk to that rabbi and you say, can I follow you? And he would ask you questions. He would talk to your parents, maybe talk to your rabbi if it wasn't a that guy, and he would check your characteristics. What is this guy's character about? Can he be like me? Does he have the aptitude? Does he have the gifting to become like me? Because after seven years of this relationship, seven years, he would send you out and he would say, go and make your own disciples, I can teach you no more. Now you in your own right are a rabbi. Now you go and train other Talmudian. Make sense? When Yeshua came and he chose, did he choose the guys who went through Beit Midrash? There's only one that we know of. Judas Iscariot. Okay? But the rest of them, fishermen, tax collectors, other people. So we go, okay, he flipped the whole paradigm. They didn't choose him. He walked up to them and he said, you can be like me. Let that sink in for a little bit. The creator of all things who squeezes himself into flesh and comes down the word of God, sits and he says, you can be like me. I'm going to raise the dead. I'm going to walk on water. I'm going to heal the sick. I'm going to open up blind eyes, deaf ears. I'm going to call them mutes will speak. What I do, now you do. Okay, got it? And he moves on. Bit, 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 bit. I'm not really sure how this works. Well, you don't have to worry about that. He's going to train you up to be like him. Now, if Peter, who's been a fisherman his entire life, understood this principle, and he says, if it is you, tell me to come. He says, says tell me to come to you on the water. The Messiah says, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water towards Yeshua. That is a massive act of faith. If he is rabbi and he said, I can be like him, let's go. I want to try this walking on the water thing. Notice he's the only disciple who screams that. He sees the impossible and someone else is doing it and he says, well, I'm not supposed to be like you, so let's go. <coughs> if you're sure, raise someone from the dead. <coughs> What's my excuse if he said I'm supposed to be like that? If he says I'll pray for him, people will be healed. What's my excuse? And Peter has this faith because he understood the process. It's something so basic. Something so cultural. And he says, okay. What you do, I will do. And he gets out and he starts walking towards Yeshua. But when he saw the wind and became afraid, as he began to sink, he yelled, Lord, save me. So notice something here. He's walking and his eyes are focused on God. And then all of a sudden, he starts to notice other things. Other gospels say the wind and the waves. He sees the wind and it freaks him out. Remember, they're in the midst of the storm. The storm hasn't stopped here. And he starts to sink and he says, help me. And he, Yeshua grabs him. He stretched out his hand. He took hold of him and he said to him, such little trust. Why did you doubt? Who's Messiah doubting? Or who is Peter doubting? Sorry. Hmm? Himself. Messiah is still standing on the water. What did he doubt? that he could be like his rabbi. So we see something miraculous in here. And they went up, they both climbed into the boat, the wind ceased, and then the main boat fell down before him and exclaimed, you really are God's son. So what's that got to do with sheep? Why did he take them through all this whole process and teach Peter at the same time? He says, remember when you were struggling for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and you felt like you were getting nowhere and you were tired and you cried out for help? What do you think those people are when they come to me? 
they have been walking without a shepherd for so long and they see someone who can give them clear direction. Don't you get all upset because they come looking for it. Later, Peter will be told to feed the flocks when in the beginning they moaned because the flocks didn't let them have their quality time. So we see something extremely profound in this. The next one, <laughs> it's going to take a bit of time. Go down, please. Next one. All right, that's that's a. Okay. So when you go to synagogue, is built on top of the foundations of the synagogue that Yeshua taught in. This is white stone, but uh, the white stone uh, synagogue. It was, I think it was second or third century, but the black stone basalt one is underneath. And this is all the ruins of the town that kind of go around the synagogue. Okay, so it's basically fun that all the same dimensions, um, the, the one that the centurion built for them. All right, next one. That's inside the synagogue. You'll notice these steps along the side. Yes? As they go, they actually go all the way around. On that side is the classroom area. You'll see two doors. You go through the doors, and there's a whole other room. These seats are where the community would gather. Where would you think the choicest seats are in the synagogue? Right. They would be sitting closer to this side. So this is where the elders of the community would the rabbi would be standing basically where I'm standing here, looking out that way. Okay? Oh, yeah, no, we can. That's fine. There's an ancient boat. All right? This is a model that they created. You go to a place in Galilee called North Guinnessar. Um, What they did there was they found an ancient Galilee boat, believe it or not, all the way through to the time of Yeshua. Some people will go as far as to say it could possibly be his. Um, two brothers basically stumbled across a nail when the, when the Sea of Galilee was really low. And when they started to look for this nail and they realized what it was, it was an ancient nail. They went back and they started to look where they found the nail and they actually uncovered a whole boat that was covered in mud. What they did was they, they, called, they called the professionals, right? And uh, something like 33 tons of chemicals was poured into this boat, lots of prayer foam, and they eventually, as they, the problem was, as you start to uncover something, it starts to be destroyed. Now, this thing has been waterlogged for a really long time. So as soon as you touch it, the wood starts to just peel away. So what they did was surround it. They chemicalized it. They put it in fog, and they dug around it, and they actually dug a channel. And as soon as they got it out, this thing still, after 2,000 years, popped up on top of the Galilee and started to sail. It until they got it to a place where they were able to pick it up very, very, very nervously with a crane and bring it in, and they were then able to treat it and restore it. So when you go actually to North Guinnessar, this is a 2,000-year-old sailboat, or the hull of it, made of many different pieces of wood. This is the model that you see just before you go into the show that they talk about it. This is what the fishing boat would look like. This is not a very big thing, okay? So just to give you a little bit of an idea. All right. I want you to go with me to... Um, let's go to Matthew 16. I try to keep this as much as in chronological order as I possibly can. I'm going to but All right. A little bit of history. There was a guy called Herod the Great, a complete um, excitable man, very paranoid, uh, you know, murdered all the, or had sent out the decree to murder all the children. He had no problem killing his own children at the site of insurrection or anything like that. But anyway, after he died, his kingdom, the whole Judea area, empowered by Rome, came in. This was under the tetrarchy of a guy called Philip. But because Rome's in charge, we want to make it all nice and nice for Caesar. We call it Caesarea Philippi, named after Caesar, but Philip was in control. 
Okay? So, to the name. So, if you look at around 13, when Yeshua came into the territory around Caesarea Philippi, let's pause. Um, go to the next picture. I just want to see something. Ah, good. That. Okay. I'll do the previous slide. I just want to show you the lab the entire cliff face. What we have here is this place was actually founded by the Greeks. It was to commemorate a guy, a god called Pan. Okay? Now, when you go to Israel today, it's a bit of a nightmare to find because it's not called Panias, or the city of Pan. It's called Panias. Now, why the name change? Because when Arabs were in control, they don't have a pa in their alphabet, but they do have a ba. So we substitute. So it became the city of Ban. Banias instead of the city of Pan. All right, just go down one. Again, 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 again. There, meet Pan. Lovely kosher fellow, half goat, half man. Okay, he um, uh, is like fertility is a wonderful practice. So that's your introduction. This is a place where he was worshipped. Can you go back to the one with the locker? Again, again, again. Right. So what we have here was a completely Greek idea of a place. This is about 30 kilometers straight up as the crow flies from the Sea of Galilee. It takes us about 45 minutes by car because the roads do this. And eventually you come out to this place. Now, what makes this place important is you actually see this cave behind here. This is called Pan's Grotto. Now, what they believed, what, back in those days, the Jordan River actually flowed out of there. One of the main tributaries that, that um, fed into the Jordan flowed out of that cave. So it was a place of fertility. It was also called... Right, because... And descend into the earth when it's warm or when it's cold to get warm during winter time and they would come out in spring and springtime is the sign of life and all exciting things so pants become optional and we do serve do things of rights and that gets them all springtime happens it's a crazy belief it was from the time it's into power caesar augustus is octavian julius caesar's Adopted Julius Caesar died. Okay, but at the time when he came into power, Augustus, after fighting this war, there was a comet that reached across for seven days. Uh, just being quite a clever politician, says, There he is, there's my daddy riding the comet, and now he's gone to heaven. So, therefore, he's ascended and become a god. So, what does that make him? The son of said god. So he is the son of God. Isn't it interesting that at that time that was. So the son of God comes in and they start to get emperor worship. And that carries on for many, many times all through, through the book where he talks about the seat of Satan. One of those things was the emperor Domitian. And Domitian built bigger statues above every at this one city. And there were all the gods underneath him, but Domitian was on top logic here. You knew about Pan, but this is about Caesar. Augustus is here. This is Pan's uh, see, the grotto is over there. It's Pan's court. This is the temple to Zeus. And over here, there's a court to a goddess called Nemesis, the god of vengeance. Goddess of vengeance. Okay? So, you're a good Jewish rabbi, and you've got good Jewish fishermen. Would you ever go to this area? No. What are you doing? We get up here, Yeshua hikes them up. For hours. Where are we going? Further than you'd ever wanted to go. <laughs> what are we doing? We're just in the territory of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, I think we took a wrong turn somewhere. Okay, you go to the next slide. This is what's left today. What I want you to lock down in your memory is look at the bare rock face. That is the gates of Hades. Next one. No, no, that's fine. 
what happened was the water was coming out of the cave, now comes out about 30 meters from the cave. Comes out straight out of the ground. This is one of the starts of the Jordan River. Ironic, isn't it? You want to where does it start? Now you see these little niches over there. Next one. These, this is where Pan's grotto was, and he was worshipped in that area. Okay. The grotto, this is the court of Pan, would put little statues cut out into the niches of the cliff face. So you would have no doubt about who was God in this region, except now we seem to have a competition later between Augustus Zeus and Pan himself. Definitely not a cool place. Okay? Is there any other one after this? All right, same thing with the niches. All right, skip that one. All right, we'll leave that for a second. Okay, so he takes him up to Caesarea Philippi and he asks to tell me to him, who do, who do you say that I am? Or who are the people saying that the Son of Man is? They said, now let's ask yourself a question. Would you take your disciples to an extremely pagan place to ask them, who am I? Oh, so there is a big lesson coming up here. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. They say, the people are saying, John the, ba John the Baptist, Yohanan the Immerser. Okay, he was dead at this time. Others say, Elijah. Elijah, powerful figure, mountaintop, very fiery guy, took on the prophet to Baal. We're in the Bible. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew 16, I'm reading from verse 14. <coughs> Either say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Why Jeremiah? Elijah, Elisha, yes. Jeremiah, an emotional guy. Elijah, fiery. Jeremiah struggled with God the whole time, crying out for the people. He said, they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to you. He was a priest. They're not going to listen to you. And we see in the book of Jeremiah, his heart-wrenching cry for a people that refused to listen. So maybe Yeshua struggled. At times, Yeshua was fiery, flipping tables in temple courts and chasing out the animals and annoying those that are in power. Someone calling out, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Someone like John the Baptist. And we sit over there and he says, these are like powerful guys. People say you're a prophet. And he says, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, Shimon Kifar answered, You are the Mashiach, the son of the living God. Now, when they did a back translation of this, it's quite interesting. He doesn't say son of the living God. He says, Ata Mashiach El. You are Messiah God. He understood that there was a link between the word of God and the father. It's the same being. And he stands up and he says, this is who you are anyway. He comes in and he goes, you are. He says, Shimon Bar Yochanan. Notice he doesn't call him Kiefer there. Yeshua said to him, how blessed are you for no human being revealed this to you. No, it is my father in heaven. So he has a revelation of who he is by God. I also tell you this. You are Kiefer, which means rock. Now let's think back. Sorry, which one do I push to go back? No, other one, other one, other one. Do you know the rock? He says, and on this rock, I will build my community. I will build my church. And even the gates of Sheol, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. Okay, now let's stop there. Let's deal with that statement. Okay, so we've got a couple of different interesting illustrations when it comes to this. Number one. On this rock, I will build my church. We were there. We didn't find any church here. But if you go back to the visiting church, is that what he was saying? No. Okay, so we didn't build a church on that. The Catholics believe that Peter is the first pope. So the church is founded by Peter, so therefore he is the rock, so therefore he's the one that we should follow. Did he say that? No. Because people tend to bow down to the Pope, and later on we'll see that when someone bows down to Peter, he picks him up and he says, mm -mm -mm, not me. 
him. So he acts completely contradictory to that. So the other translation is at his statement that Yeshua is the Messiah, that is the foundational statement of what this community is. Is that correct? Interesting. Okay. And he says, I'm going to build my community around this, and even the gates of Sheol will not overcome it. Now, this another statement. So when you go into Israel, you walk through city gate after city gate after city gate. What is a gate for? Right. To keep people safe inside. You, when you see the size of the gate, you'll understand. It's the size of this room. You have four chambers to funnel in attackers, and you can stab them from the top. And they'll break in the outer gate, and then you'll go up, always fighting uphill, and then you'll get to the next gate. It's a problem. You're tired. Very difficult to take a city like that. Okay? But he says, even the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Who's attacking? No. He says, the gates of Hades are shut. Who's the one kicking the door down? You're the one that's supposed to be attacking. You're the one that's supposed to be taking ground. You're the one with the... These understandings to stand up and say, God is with me, you will not stand. And he will break down stronghold after stronghold because you walk out in faith, understanding that Yeshua is the Messiah. Today we think of our little communities and we want to close the gates, block out the world. Let's build little schools where only we can go. Let's go to little shops that we can go. We will build communities and we will keep us safe. He marched them up to Caesarea Philippi and he says, all right, let's talk about knocking down this gate. It's not about building your own community. It's about expanding the kingdom. Now, who's more powerful? The God who is with you or the enemy that's over there? He says, the gates will fall. Trust me. They marched around Jericho. The walls fell. The gates fell. Everything's going to fall. God will be left standing. It says, Hmm. Let me stop there for a second. You guys? Okay, up until this point. Okay. Now, there's an interesting interpretation to this. Now, for the most part, we all agree that this foundational statement that he is the Messiah is what really builds this idea of this biyachad, this community of believers, right? But that's not the fullness of what he was talking about here. You see, Messiah was preparing him for something. Now, if you quickly jump to Acts 10. I'm going to summarize the story. Acts 9, we see an interesting portion where Peter gets a vision. Right? And in this thing, he's standing in a place called Joppa. What, who else was in, in the area of Joppa? Jonah. So Jonah went out to which place he was he supposed to go? Nineveh. Gentile or Jewish place? Gentile place. Right. So he's standing in a place where he was going to be sent to the Gentiles. Peter gets a vision. He sees something that he's been seeing there every day. Now the thing is this very deep water, so you can't exactly come close and then just offload. So what they do is they take the big sail and they lay it out on the deck, put the stuff in, attach it to the yard arm, and then they swing it out to the side and they drop it on the side. They unpack, they pick it up, and he goes, and they do it again. He's sitting over there, and he sees a sheet, a four-cornered sheet, a sail. And when it opens up, he sees what? Lots and lots of unclean animals. And then he hears this voice. What does the voice say? Yeah, arise, Peter, take anything unclean in my mouth. Now, is this after the resurrection and crucifixion of Christ? Yes. So if, just a point to ponder, if Messiah taught to eat all things clean, surely his disciples would have done so. Oh, eat all things unclean, right? So he still says, I have never done it. So that must mean one thing. 
Yeshua ate kosher. His disciples copied their rabbi. So they go to this he hears it three times. So after all of this, the sheep gets taken up to heaven and he's confused. Scripture says he was puzzling over the vision. What could this mean? It can't be contradictory to what God said, but this must mean something. What is it? What he doesn't know is the place called the Tima. Go down. Uh huh. Go down. All right, meet Caesarea. This is what we call the Hippodrome. Horse races, tribute unto Caesar. You see the king's box when you walk in it? This is the epitome of Roman life. The king's box. When you take part in this, you declare and you fight for who God. And you declare it by saying, Caesar. Sounds similar. Very similar. Who is God? So he comes up over there and you've got this extreme city here. Here you have a theater. Go to the next slide. Wait, uh, yeah, that's fine. What you see here is your Roman theater. The Hippodrome is actually on this side. This is an artist's reconstruction. You have a natural, um, not a natural, a uh, man made harbor. And you actually see in this section, go back one. This piece here was part of Hippodrome's palace. Ocean, and he put his swimming pool in the middle of the sea. He had a little bit of a point to prove. He against me. So he built a nice little port so that when his friends from Rome would come up and visit, he would be able to bring them in and entertain them as if they were in Rome. Go back. Roman city, Roman civilization, Roman thing. And in the midst of the city was a man called Neil. And he was praying at the time of 3 o'clock. Why, why 3 o'clock? Afternoon sacrifice. Afternoon sacrifices were taking place then. He was looking towards Jerusalem. And then an angel appears and he says, Cornelius, God has you on his mind. I love that statement. I'm like, you know, the creator of the world is looking at you and he's going, wow, I really like this kid. He said, he's seen all your acts of Sedeca. He's seen your love. He's seen how you're looking after people. He's seen it, but he was a God-fearer. He never converted to Judaism. So then he was always ostracized. He said, you can't come close to, to the God of the Jews. There was always a separation between the Gentiles and the Jews. Romans and Jews don't like each other very much, especially when the Romans took a big part in crucifying their Messiah. Well, at least those that believed anyway. There was lots of bloodshed between the two. But Rome was in control. You don't need to go look far. Augustus is everywhere. He's even in Banyas. And he says, go send your guys to Joppa. There's a guy there called Peter. And he was, go and call him. He'll explain everything. So they send some guys. And as you can imagine, after the crucifixion of your rabbi, a Roman to talk to you. How eager do you think Peter would be to run down the steps and go, yes, please, pick me. Not so much. So he needed to see something and then God said, don't worry, just go with him. He was still puzzling over the meaning. What is this about? And when he gets there, you see in Acts 10 that he starts to explain to Cornelius and his entire household about this Messiah. And the Holy Spirit pours out onto them. I know I'm jumping the gun a little bit. It's a bit all over the place, but we need to understand the context of Banyas. And he says, and now understand. He says, we are, or cannot call anything unclean which God has called clean. Now here's the kicker. The rabbis, before, referred to the cities as the gates of Hades. The gates of Hades will not stand. This moment here was a culmination of a prophetic understanding. Peter, you are going to take that statement, take it all the way into the Gentile cities, and it will collapse. That stronghold will become mine. After that, we find Paul being locked up here a few times. We see him leaving on his missions to go out into the nations from this very port. And he uses Roman infrastructure to go knock down Roman strongholds in expanding the kingdom of God. Banyas making more sense now. 
Who do you say that I am? Go and live it. Go and show them. Sixteen. This will bring us to the next part. Um, uh, yes. Now, now we're getting to the weird trans. It, it was a little bit confusing before. Yes. Listen to the next part. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited. Whatever you bind in heaven or you will be bound in heaven. And whatever you permit, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this is interesting. Again, it only makes sense if we put it back in the context. You got the keys to the kingdom, my boy. Whatever you allow and whatever you don't allow. Using are two halakhic, halakhic terms that rabbis would use. Go with me to Acts 15. Again, after Acts 9, Acts 10, the next part of this prophecy or this identity becomes more apparent. In Acts 15, we know that Paul and him are out in the nations and they're baptizing people. They bring people. We get the first big council of this community. And in this big council of this community, they've got questions that they need to ask. Okay. But some men came down from Yehuda to Antioch and began teaching the brothers, you can't, you can't be saved unless you undergo Brit Milah, circumcision in the manner prescribed by Moses. What is the argument about? Salvation or circumcision? Salvation. Okay, now let's just think about this logically. Was Abraham considered righteous or after circumcision? Right. So circumcision was part of his heart condition. It was a prerequisite to relationship, correct? Does that nullify the sign? No. It's still when we look at this, unless, and this is, gets another meaning, because to the Jews, when I say to the circumcised or to the uncircumcised, about just the circumcision. I'm talking about if you are circumcised, you're Jewish. If you're not circumcised, you're a Gentile. So if you, you cannot be saved unless you become a Jew. That's really what's going on here. You have a proselyte to have a Jewish Messiah. Makes sense. And no. You must understand the point. This brought them into no small measure of discord and dispute with Shaul and Barnaba. Paul is having some real excitement. And aside to Shaul, Barnaba, and summoned them to themselves, so they put this question before the emissaries and the elders in Jerusalem. It says, after being sent off by the congregation through Phoenicia and Shomron, recounting in detail how the Gentiles have turned to God. And this news brought great joy to all the brothers. On arrival in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the Messianic community, including the emissaries and the elders, and they reported what God had done through them. But some of those who had come to trust were from the party of the Pharisees. What is a Pharisee? Okay, in a nutshell, have a lot of tradition, extreme pious people, but they have traditions that seem to overrule Torah. Problem. They believe in the afterlife, just like Messiah did. They believed in angels and demons, just like other factions of Jews didn't, like the Sadducees. Okay? And they said, is it necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the Torah of Moshe? Is it necessary concerning salvation? Now remember, when a Pharisee wants to add to and say, let's make them like us, it is not is all of their instructions on top of Torah. And Paul says, I am a Pharisee. That was after he became a believer. He still identified with his people, right? The emissaries and elders met to, uh, met to meet and look into this matter. After a lengthy debate, Peter got up and said to them, brothers, you yourselves know what good deeds a while back God chose for me from you to be the one who whose mouth the Gentiles should hear the message of the good news. 
He's talking about Cornelius and come to trust. And God, who knows the heart, bore them witness by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So there is no distinction between us and them, but cleanse by their heart by trust. So why are you putting them to the test now by putting on a yoke of the Talmudim, or the neck, sorry, a yoke on the neck of the Talmudim, which neither our fathers nor we have had the strength to bear? He's not talking about the law of Moses. He's not talking about Torah. He's talking to a Pharisee. He says, dude, we can't even keep up with you guys. Now you want the Gentiles who don't even understand left or right to understand Pharisaical law. Let's just take a step back, shall we? No, it is through the loving kindness of the Lord Yeshua that we trust and are delivered, and it's in the same way with them. Then the whole assembly kept still, and they listened to Barnabas, Barnabas and Shaul, about all well, the signs and the miracles God had done through them among the Gentiles. Jacob, this is James the Just, if we want to put it that way, according to church, church tradition, Yeshua's brother, broke the silence to reply, brothers, he said, here is what I have to say. Shimon has told in detail what God did when he first began to show his concerns for taking from among the Gentiles a people to bear his name. And the words of the prophets are in complete harmony with that. And he quotes them. I'm just skipping for time's sake. Verse 19. Therefore, in my opinion, is what we should not put obstacles, that we should not put obstacles in the way of the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them a letter telling them to abstain. Listen carefully. Abstain from things polluted by idols, from fornication, from strangled, from things strangled, and from blood. Listen to the next verse. For from the earliest times, Moshe has had in every city those who proclaim him with his words being read in the synagogues every Shabbat. These four things are the starting point for a believer to come into this congregation. Now, break them down very quickly. If I were to sit there and tell you who don't know anything about God, stay away from things polluted by idols. What's your first question? What's an idol? Go back into Leviticus and find out we're not allowed to make graven images, etc., etc. Is that a place for you? Temple of Augustus, Bania's place. We don't take that into our house. So I teach them Torah. From fornication. What's fornication? Sexual immorality. What does that mean? Let's go back into Leviticus and talk to you about it. He says, he goes on, from things strangled from blood. Well, that's an odd one. From things strangled and from blood. Things strangled? It's kosher eating, actually. Things you're allowed to eat and things you're not allowed to eat. When you, let, let, me, let me do this. What's the number one prescribed way to kill pork in America? Strangling. The blood stays in the meat. It is not drained properly. So it's not only an unclean animal, but it becomes even more unclean because the blood is not drained. When something is cooked, they cut it and they hang it. Pretty much every major Western civilization understands that we need to hang the meat for a period of time to let the blood go out. Otherwise, it becomes a problem. Where do you think we got that lesson from? If you strangle it, you never let out the blood. What's with the blood? The life is in the blood. What are you talking about, man? Let's go back to Torah and talk about it. It says they sat there for a month at times. But he said, guys, if you come into this, let's use it in our place. We have a church. We've got a community of believers. Come in, would have a word with the new believer who comes into the door from a very Roman society and says, Come on, we used to do this all the time. Why are you people so dull? He says, no, no, no. What you have learned from them is not here. And he gives them baby steps. When we get together, don't bring things that were on the altar of Augustus and bring meat into this congregation and let's eat things that are polluted by idols. Have they killed it properly? Do you know what animal it is? Do you know what was going on when they had that celebration? So guys, we have to be so set apart. And every time we get to get on Shabbat, we're going to teach you, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. But in the beginning, this is our four basic things. If these are the only four things 
that we as Gentiles have to worry about. We don't have to worry about theft. Can I steal? No? Can I murder? Doesn't say anything about murder here. And we make it fit our bowl because we don't want to. The ironic thing is it talks about kosher eating, yet for the most part, Gentiles don't want to hear anything about kosher eating. But we use that to help justify our case. It's not what he's talking about. Back to Matthew 16. That would you permit. Guys, this is the beginning of four basic statements bound in Torah. This is your entry requirement. Let's have a conversation. You don't have to be coming to our synagogue. Let us teach you about God. We're the light of the world. We want to show you who he is. You can sit here and you can listen to Torah. Do you know how that departed in the second and third century when you as a Gentile would have to sit outside of a building for up to two or three years before they even let you in the building? And then you sit on the floor in front of the children. And if you're big enough one day and you show that you're really committed, you can sit in the chair behind you. What are you going to do with the knowledge of our God? Does that sound like God? But it was something that he was preparing him to say here. We've made it into some spiritual warfare ministry tool. I bind whatever the enemy says. That's not what he's talking about. He says, for us as a community, we say, listen... Guys, let's 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 make a make a standard understanding here. When you come in here, these are the basic rules for this place. And he was dealing with Romans, and he had to de-Romanize them to understand them that they need to come into kingdom. That statement needs to be reread in the context of Peter's life, and we will understand what Yeshua was saying from that point. Whatever you allow. God says, all right, I've got your back. Whatever you don't allow, it's okay. You understand my heart. You get me now. And this becomes the outline of Peter's ministry. And that all happens at a place that was extremely... Your statement will lead you to a life of standing up for him... In the midst of all the gods in the world, there is only one. What do you permit in your congregation? This is our foundation. You're not going to learn it all in one go. It's going to take time. How many of you have taken a good couple of years to figure out what's going on in the first part of the book? But I want to get you to that next level. God never contradicted. He was building something. And he had to take a people who didn't understand anything about him. These sort of places. Banyas. At the feet of the Hades. We're going to knock them down so that the kingdom can expand. Everybody understand? All right. I've shot over my time. My apologies. We will carry on with this week.